So finally, we're going to hear from Martin Green, who's the chief executive of the Hull Culture Company. Hull is a city uh, in northeast England, which was the city of culture last year. Martin, I think, is going to talk about the year of city of culture. Martin. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I am no longer the chief executive of the culture company in Hull, uh, not because I was sacked, I've, I've moved on to another job, uh, and I'll explain more about that uh, in a minute. Um, just uh, to give you a bit, I'll oh, start the clock. Who's got the clock? Start the clock. Um, uh, I um, uh, am and passionate about culture and cities, and I've spent my life working in cities. So I spent five years working for the Mayor of London. I then spent a further five years working on the London Olympic Games, where I produced the opening and closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. And then I went to work in the city of Hull uh, as the director of the UK City of Culture, program, um, which I'm going to tell you about. So it's great to be here. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome we've had over the past two days. It's great to be in a country that talks about the weather more than the British. Um, that was really comforting. Um, there is a big caveat on, on talking about this, of course, which is all I'm doing is sharing a story. Right? I hope you might take something from it, uh, I hope it might inspire you, but if it doesn't, that's okay, because as our speaker said this morning, this is about sharing, this is not offering some kind of blueprint on how to do things. Um, I was reminded of the, the great provocateur Philip Dodd, the ex-director of the ICA in London, who said there are no more countries anymore, there are just cities, uh, when I was putting this together. Um, I've lost my place. Uh, <laughs> I always thought that art could change the world. Um, but thanks to the University of Hull and the research they did on City of Culture, we now know uh, that art can change the world. Um, over 365 days, we produced two 1,800 events in 300 venues, um, and, but what we did at the basis of it was told the story of a city and of the people of a place. So let's just skip back. If you go on to the next slide, or do I do this? Oh, that's me. Do you don't want to look at that? Right, first of all, let's get the basics right. This is Hull, yeah, in the increasingly independent state of the United, this United Kingdom. Uh, uh, there it is, there's an arrow. Uh, now, Hull, uh, I'll go back one, was described like this. Come Judgment Day, the city would be leased out indefinitely to Satan, providing housing for the damned. Uh, it, it was what was written about it. Um, <laughs> and this is where, this is, this is when you talk about how cities feel and talk about themselves. Because if a city is told it is no good for too long, it will start to believe that. And this is where the UK City of Culture project came in. The UK City of Culture project came out of Liverpool being the European capital of culture in 2008. Uh, and we were then not due to be able to hold a European capital of culture for about 15 years. Obviously now we'll never do it. But um, the good that came out of that was a desire that every four years the UK would nominate its own UK City of Culture. But the crucial decision was that it would go to cities that need it. It would not go to the metropolises. Because I think what you've seen with the growth of the metropolises, and they are fabulous, is second and third tier cities going, what are we for? What do we do? And I think their impulse is to go, well, how can we be more like London and Manchester? And that's not the answer. London and Manchester are fabulous, but they are London and Manchester. So what cities actually need to do is find their own voice. And actually, often, that's a case of refinding their voice. Um, so the City of Culture project in 2017 sought to do that in Hull. Um, and some really interesting things sat underneath the, st the statistics. More than nine out of 10 residents went to at least one event, which for the UK is staggering. Two in three residents said it increased their knowledge of the history of the city. 60% of the audience were first time bookers. 
Eight, ten, eight in ten participants said taking part made them happier. So whilst we've got solid financial statistics of economic input, that is the key one. Because happy cities are confident cities and confident cities can do anything they like. Let's talk about this finding your voice thing. Our first season, we did four seasons split into, uh, into a quarter, was called Made in Hull. Of course it would be. And this was about telling the story. Now, all cities have dominant narratives. In Hull, it's about the fishing industry and the Second World War. And whilst those stories must continue to be told, they are often owned by old white men and they often drown out the new stories or the different stories or the stories that sit underneath that. So Made in Hull, the first thing we did was a week-long installation throughout the whole city which celebrated those dominant narratives. We expected 100,000 people to come, 343,000 people turned up, got a bit hairy for a while. Um, but that was a way of celebrating those dominant narratives, but also saying, right, we've done that, can we now talk about something else? Um, and so, this is Blade uh, by Nayan Kul Khan. Uh, Hull's future lies in green energy, it feels, and so there is now a factory there making wind turbine blades. This is the largest handmade single object in the world, and it is made by the men and women of Hull. And so we put it in the square, which was no mean feat. We had to take down 10 sets of traffic lights and 17 lampposts to get that in there, and the artist wanted it to be a surprise. So. <laughs> So we did it overnight. And there's another thing about cities. 200 people made this possible, from planners to transport managers, and nobody told anybody, right? Because it was part of the act. Uh, this is why I wish to communicate with you. Residents of a tower block were invited to put a gel over outside their, their, their door. That was it. Uh, headline in the newspaper next day, I've spoken to my neighbor for the first time ever. Right? And so it went on finding these new, new stories. Basil Kirchin, the godfather of electronic dance music, is from Hull. Coombe Transmissions, who got chased out of Hull in the 70s by the cops, went to London, did a show called Prostitution, which was closed in one day, and in Parliament they were described as wreckers of civilization. They're from Hull. Uh, the spiders from Mars are from Hull. Who knew, right? And this amazing woman called Lillian Balocca who fought the fishing industry to demand better rights for ship workers, uh, who realized that there was a myth uh, that, that the, 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 the ship workers wouldn't leave the dock if their wives and girlfriends were on the dock. So in order to stop it happening, they all went down there and stood there until change was made. She, she was there. So this was about finding these stories, which some people knew, some people didn't, some we knew. We also made up stories, because the stories don't have to be real, right? <laughs> the land of green ginger. Seven artists in the seven boroughs of Hull for two years uh, in, in the largest piece of community work that we did, going into communities and finding out their stories. So Scotty took over a disused shop uh, on a high street, painted the door gold and put a sign outside saying, dare you walk through the door. And if you did, you were greeted by four drag queens who gave you a cup of tea and had a chat. Now, this was about extracting the stories from people, and one of the stories we found was the back alleys in Hull, with, where the houses back onto each other are called ten-foots. And there's a myth in East Hull that one of these ten-foots only appears at midnight. And if you walk through it, magical things happen. So we made that happen. And fathers and daughters and sons and granddads were all sharing the story that was very much about Hull, but of course is a, is a shared story. Um, flood. Hull is the uh, second most likely city in the UK to be flooded after London, because it's so flat and on the water. And so we did a show that lasted 365 days, online, on television, and live in, in various parts through the year. This was one of the live parts. It was all staged on a floating stage in one of the docks, working with the local community. Another part of it was on BBC television. Another part was online, and you can, you can still watch it. It's still out there. Uh, and it wasn't just about the art, it was about other things like our volunteer programs. 3,000 volunteers we had, 
um, and never underestimate the power and culture of art. By the way, the, the, the definition of culture I worked to was given to me by Phil Redmond, who said, culture is the sum total of all our creativity. That's the definition I worked to. So we had 3,000 volunteers who were doing various things. It was absolutely life-changing. This is particularly where I think you see the in intersection of culture and health because we had a lot of older people here who were suffering from social isolation, who suddenly got out and made new friends, as well as younger people. We ran... Let's do it that way. Oh, go on. Can you make that go forward? Otherwise, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Aha, right, we had a, a big engagement, five minutes, we had a big engagement program, uh, this is called Fuzz Feed, so if you, you take kids around our exhibitions and you record them verbatim and then you put them in the mouths of these puppets, and it was a way of brokering the conversation about art with young people, they then operated the puppets, filmed it and put it online, uh, there's a, they're all online now, just look up Fuzz Feed Hull, they are the most entertaining, brilliant thing about engaging children in art, you will ever see, I guarantee you. Um, and then uh, our big community uh, engagement program, which I've spoken about before. So that is a canter through. I'm actually early, so I might play the video. Are you? Uh, yeah, well, it's queued up, isn't it? We'll just play it up. Right. So, um, so look, the basis of the thing is, yes, of course, cities can tell the story of nations, right? In the UK, this is going to be very, very important over the next few years because we are currently going through an idiotic, pointless act which will ruin the lives of a generation of young people. And there is no better way to get through a massive identity shift than through culture. And I'm pleased at least that some money has been put aside in the next couple of years to try and deal with this big identity shift that we are being forced to go through. Um, I'll finish off just by, you know, we're here for a creative concert, why don't you have a look at what we did in Hull, have a think about your own stories, have a think about how cities add to the patchwork of the story of a country uh, and find their own voice. So let's see if it works. Do you want to try and play that? Actually, I'm done. Uh, quality, participatory, public art in public space is what it's all about. Ramble man, thanks for listening.